Um, what I'm going to talk about this morning is the concept of friendship. And I want to, so when I use the word friendship, I'm using it in quotes, all right? Um, friendship means different things to different people at different times. And so what I'd like to do is talk about the relationship between an ex-slave business entrepreneur named Elizabeth Keckley and First Lady Mary Lincoln. I'm assuming you all know who Mary Lincoln is, but I can fairly assume that you probably don't know very much about Elizabeth Keckley. So what I'd like to do is to talk about their, I, I want to divide my uh, comments into four categories. The first, I want to tell you the story of their relationship and, it, and its demise. And then I want to explain why it was fragile to begin with and why it was doomed from the beginning. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to go. So I want you to picture, it's the day after the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, his first inauguration. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and a very well-dressed African-American mulatto uh, is, approaches the door of the White House, and she knocks on the door. She has an appointment with Mary Todd Lincoln. So she's escorted into Mrs. Lincoln's presence. And uh, Mrs. Lincoln is expecting her because some of the most prominent women in Washington, D.C. have been hiring her to make their dresses. She's a, she's a dressmaker. As a matter of fact, she's what's called a modiste. A modiste is a woman who designs the clothes and then makes them. All right. So I want you to think American Coco Chanel. All right. Okay. So that's what she is. Um, Mary Lincoln has had, uh, she, she is an ex-slave. She got her freedom in St. Louis. In 1860, she arrives in Washington, D.C. And by um, 1861, she is already the modiste for Verena Davis, Robert E. Lee's wife, his sister-in-law, uh, uh, Stephen Douglas's wife. So she is, uh, she's really entrepreneurial. She is really... Uh, become the dressmaker for some of the most important women in Washington society. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln was, introdu was introduced to her and has invited her to come to the White House. And um, I don't know how much you know about Mary Lincoln, but she's extraordinarily cheap. All right. <laughs> um, she uh, says, oh yes, I've heard of you. Some of my friends in St. Louis used you as their dressmaker. But you have to understand I'm from the West and we have no money. So if we can strike a deal, if you're cheap enough, you will have my exclusive dressmaking orders, all right? So what Elizabeth Keckley is getting is an exclusive contract with the First Lady. And this um, was her ambition. She writes in her autobiography, ever since arriving in Washington, I had a great desire to work for the ladies of the White House. And to accomplish this, this end, I was ready to make almost any sacrifice consistent with propriety. So she begins to make Mary Lincoln's dresses. And Mary Lincoln, um, is, Mary Lincoln is very Southern. And I want you to keep in mind, as I'm talking about this, she is very used to exploiting the labor of slaves. All right, so just keep that in mind as I talk about what their, how their relationship develops. Okay, they, so they have their negotiation. She begins to spend a great deal of time in the White House with Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln has brought a lady's maid with her to the White House and has written to a friend that the lady's maid is completely unsatisfactory. Now, a lady's maid for Mary Lincoln meant that you uh, dressed her um, you did her hair, etc. And Elizabeth Keckley was there and can provide that service. And so Mary Lincoln begins to use Elizabeth Keckley not only as her dressmaker, but also as her lady's maid. Now, there is no comment about whether Keckley was being paid for this extra service. All right, so keep that in mind, too. Um, it, it required a great deal of time. That meant that any time the Lincolns had a social occasion. Elizabeth Keckley was expected not only to make the dress, but to come to the White House, dress the First Lady, dress her hair, make sure she had clean white gloves, 
you know, and, and Lincoln would come in and take her on her arm, and then she had to wait in the White House until Mary Lincoln came back so she could undress her, all right? So we're talking about extraordinary amount of time. She becomes a uh, intimate with the Lincoln family sim simply because she spends so much time with her, and they become what is called, a, she becomes Mary Lincoln's confidant, all right? And at one point, Mary Lincoln will say, um, that Keckley was her best living friend. Now, it is my contention that friendship was probably not what was going on. So what I'd like to do is to develop that idea and say, okay, it is true they had a relationship. It is also true they, they were very fond of one another. It was also true that, they were, that Keckley was involved in Lincoln's life. It is, there is no evidence that Lincoln was involved in Keckley's life. All right, so what I'd like to do then is to talk about what were the barriers to what we would commonly think of as friendship. The first, first two important barriers are race and class. This was an ex-slave uh, from Virginia, freedom in St. Louis. Mary Lincoln is from Kentucky. Mary Lincoln has grown up with slaves. Um, so race and class would have been really the big barriers to, to a friendship between the two women. And in fact, one Southern historian has said that the, relation, the domestic relationship between mistress and slave, or white women and black women in the same household, is a kind of warring intimacy. So if you take that sort of as basis for this relationship, I would suggest that friendship between those two women was impossible, as we understand it, for three different reasons, besides race and class. The first one is that from beginning to end, their relationship was transactional. If you note, the first thing that they did was to, to, was to have a verbal contract. You can have my exclusive dressmaking orders in return, I will pay you. Um, that transactional relationship continued throughout, throughout the time that they spent together. Uh, as I said, uh, Elizabeth Keckley acted as a maid, a lady's maid. Uh, there's no evidence that she was paid. Now, you have to think to yourself, okay, you know, if you've got an exclusive contract with the first lady, you might provide some free services because her patronage is what is going to make your career in Washington. And so it is quite possible that Elizabeth Keckley expected this as sort of extra services that she provided for the First Lady. We just don't know, all right? We just don't have any record of that. Um, the, the second example of this is that when Lincoln died, Elizabeth, uh, when Lincoln was assassinated that night, Mary Lincoln sent for Elizabeth Keckley. And whoever she sent didn't know where to find Elizabeth Keckley. So Keckley didn't know that Lincoln had been assassinated until she got up the next morning and someone said, you know, Lincoln has been assassinated, Mrs. Lincoln's been looking for you, and of course then she joined Mrs. Lincoln. Um, she was really crucial in getting Mrs. Lincoln through that, those first stages of widowhood. And when Mrs. Lincoln went to uh, Springfield and back to Illinois, she took Elizabeth Keckley with her. So for six weeks, this Keckley by this time is an entrepreneurial dressmaker with a workshop full of 22 seamstresses. This is, she's a major businesswoman in Washington, D.C. And Mary Lincoln says, you will go with me. And so she expected Elizabeth Keckley to give up her business and go to, to, for an undetermined amount of time to Illinois. Uh, Elizabeth Keckley did it. She spent six weeks in Illinois. She came back to, the, to Washington, D.C. to resume her business, and it is clear she expected to be paid. Mary Lincoln didn't give her a penny. So she billed the United States government for six weeks of labor, and we have the receipt. The government paid her for six weeks of labor, her travel expenses, and her mourning clothes, because she had to have a whole new wardrobe. Um, so it's clear that she did it because she cared about Mrs. Lincoln, but she also did it because she's a businesswoman. All right, so the, the transactional nature of their relationship continues. 
The fourth example I want to give is at some point in 1867, Mary Lincoln decided she didn't have enough money to live on. And we could go into that in great detail, but I don't have time. Um, so she decided that the best way to, to preserve her financial um, well-being was to take all of the clothes that Elizabeth Keckley had made for her, take them to Washington, D.C., and sell them. Now, she was going to do this anonymously. So she shows up in, in New York City, and she's all veiled, et cetera, and she takes some jewelry to a jeweler to sell that, and it has Lincoln on the inside, inscribed on the inside. So she, her anonymity didn't last very long. But again, Elizabeth Keckley has gone back to Washington, D.C. She's got this thriving business, and, and Lincoln says to her, you will come to New York because I need you. So Elizabeth drops her business. She goes to New York. This little enterprise called the Old Clothes Scandal is incredibly stupid, all right? It's, it, it was a complete failure. And Mary Lincoln realizes that she's not going to get the money she wants. There's a wonderful cartoon in um, one of the journals of, of women going through uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's dress, dresses, you know, and she didn't sell anything. Um, and she gets sort of downhearted, so she goes back to Illinois and she says to Elizabeth Keckley, now I want you to stay here in New York and I want you to clean up this mess. So Keckley stays in New York. She has not given her any living expenses. And she keeps writing to her saying, someday I'll have some money and I will put you in more comfortable circumstances. Someday I will have more money. Finally, she says, well, just get a job sewing for New York ladies. It is at that point, Elizabeth Keckley decides she's going to write her memoir. It's called Behind the Scenes. It's very readable. It's called Behind the Scenes, and it is the first tell-all. Um, it didn't sell many, it was widely advertised in places like the Montana Territory. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, the publisher did a really good job of advertising it. Didn't sell many copies. Uh, Elizabeth Keckley says she wrote it um, because she, she didn't say she needed the money, but she did need the money. She wrote it because some, people had said her story was interesting. Yeah. Um, because uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, no one really understood Mary Todd Lincoln and she needed to redeem Mary Todd Lincoln's reputation. And because she was associated with Mary Todd Lincoln, she needed to redeem her own uh, reputation. And um, the fact of the matter was that um, Mary Todd Lincoln had given up any claim to privacy because she was so intent on appearing in American newspapers. So she wasn't doing any more damage to Mar Mary Lincoln than Mary Lincoln had already done to herself. Mary Lincoln cut off all contact with her best living friend. And the only comment about Elizabeth Keckley after the book came out was she called her that colored historian. So that's the story of their relationship, all right? And that's what happened. So what I'd like to talk about is I've already described their transac transactional relationship. I'd like to talk about two concepts. One is the concept of privacy. And the third is the concept of celebrity. And I want to show how that uh, undermined whatever relationship they might have had. So first we'll start with privacy. Privacy was really, in the, in the early 19th century, a northern phenomenon. It was really hard to live privately on a plantation in the south. There were just too, too many people around. Uh, just to give you an idea, the Todd household in Kentucky had nine people in 1820, 20 people in 1830, and seven people in 1840. So this would be white and black alike. There's no privacy there. Keckley uh, had, her household had 32 people in 1820, seven, 74 people in 1830, and 60 people in 1840. Um, I want you to think about privacy for Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln never had any privacy until she moved to Illinois and became a middle-class housewife for a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois. She had always lived in the South. She'd always lived surrounded, both at school and at home, with a huge number of people. Um, 
So privacy was, they had different conceptions of privacy. Elizabeth Keckley could never have appreciated privacy the same way Mary Lincoln did. And therefore, when she invades Mary Lincoln's privacy, it's, she, they just don't have the same concept. Uh, the other thing is that a dressmaker, I want you to think ladies, um, hairdressers. There is the myth, I don't know whether it's true or not, that ladies will tell their hairdressers anything. Same thing is true of dressmakers. All right, they, would, they stood for long hours, tedious hours, they carried on conversations. They would tell their dressmakers things. You know, I mean, Elizabeth Keckley knew more about Mary Lincoln's financial problems than Abraham Lincoln knew, all right? So again, her, her concept as a dressmaker of privacy is going to be completely different from that of her customers. Okay, the second thing is the rise of celebrity, celebrity culture. This begins in the early 19th century. Um, it is uh, advanced by newspaper editors like James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald, of Matthew Brady, uh, the photographer, and P.T. Barnum, who, of course, uh, made celebrity. Keckley is very proud of her celebrity dressmaking. All right, she becomes a dre celebrity dressmaker, so she knows about celebrity. And uh, Mary Lincoln is desperate for attention, and so she... Uh, cultivates any newspaper uh, coverage she can possibly cultivate so that this idea of celebrity is um, a, uh, something that both of these women are very conscious of and they both use it. But celebrity destroys your privacy. You can't be a celebrity and be a private citizen all at the same time. Um, so Ultimately, what happened to that relationship with the publication of Behind the Scenes is that those factors, that transactional relationship, celebrity and privacy, undermined what was a very close relationship, but I submit that it wasn't a friendship. Um, and I, I'm assuming you all know Mary Todd Lincoln returns to Illinois. She's committed uh, to an insane asylum, and she dies at her, at her sister's house in Springfield. Um, of, uh, she dies of a stroke in 1882. Keckley lived a very long life in Washington, D.C. Um, she never regained her prominence for a variety of reasons. One is the invention of the sewing machine, which, you know, destroyed part of it. I mean, she, she wanted to do the whole process, and what became true is that women wanted their dressmakers to design and fit the dress, but they were going to save money by using the sewing machine themselves. And the other thing is that during the Civil War, the thousands of contraband who came into Washington, D.C., there were many dressmakers among those contraband, so there's more competition. Um, so I would suggest that the reason that that friendship was not possible is that there was an, sort of an asymmetry of power. Mary simply had more power than Elizabeth Keckley did. Keckley was dependent on Mary. And that Mary never really understood what the basis of the relationship was, which allowed her to claim friendship where there really wasn't any. Thank you. Hello and good morning. It's great to be here today with you all. I always know I'm back in the South and my hair just kind of gets bigger and bigger due to the humidity. <laughs> so I am also looking at Mary Lincoln, but approaching her from a little bit of a different perspective, situating Mary Lincoln in um, the Civil War and connecting her beha behavior to um, ideas of domesticity, these gender roles that relegated women's behavior in the 19th century. A true lady is loved by all is how North Carolinian Kate Landing summed up the requirements of the cult of domesticity. This idea permeated the 19th century United States and it emphasized a lady's devoted service to her family, fealty to her community, an espousal of certain character qualities, including kindness, gentleness, and self-control. The latter quality was also supposed to limit her behavior in certain key ways. 
She was to be in control of her person, her manners, and her tongue at all times. She should never be angry or utter an unkind word. And I think as Sylvia has shown us, Mary Lincoln had difficulty conforming to these standards. In fact, it almost goes without saying that she was most certainly not loved by all. Even a cursory glance at the way in which her friends, family, acquaintances, and historians have talked about her demonstrates that she might, in fact, have been quite difficult to love. Not only was she not loved by all, but Lincoln frequently transgressed the standards of domesticity, and often in very public ways, particularly during the time she spent in the White House. Her sharp tongue lashed out at friends, family, and her husband's political associates. Her temper was legendary, and on a number of occasions, and yes, during her time in the White House, she grew visibly angry with her husband in front of other people. In addition, Lincoln had difficulty conforming to the aspects of domesticity that prescribed women's place in society and in the nation as well. Um, these standards said that um, women's role was in the home, separate from the man's world of work and politics, and that really the only acceptable involvement for women in kind of formal party politics was not an active involvement at all, but was instead a, num a different type of service, again, connected to those ideas of domesticity. Um, an unfeeling support of the Union, um, and this becomes very important during the Civil War, um, that she inculcated not only in herself, but also in her husband and her children as well. Mary Lincoln also struggled to conform to these roles. Um, she loved politics, and she frequently gave her husband advice on political matters. She also loved attention, again, as Sylvia has noted, and she sought newspaper coverage of the parties and receptions that she hosted, as well as of her travels during her White House tenure. So Lincoln's lack of conformity to 19th century gender roles and the controversy that it raised has plagued more than one historian, which is what the subject of, of my uh, analysis is. Her behavior is often challenging to contextualize, and it can be difficult to separate her contemporaries' legitimate criticisms of her with their contempt for her flouting of traditional roles. This problem is particularly acute for those writing historical um, or for those writing bio biographical accounts of her or her husband's life. For biographers, Lincoln presents a particular problem as a woman who seemingly struggled to conform to 19th century standards. And she's even more challenging con to contextualize during her time in the White House. As a first lady, as the wife of Abraham Lincoln, and as a person, and one who was not always likable, Lincoln has greatly divided historical biographers who principally argue that Lincoln was not a good first lady, was not a good wife, and was not always a good person. This paper examines the ways in which historical biographers have dealt with Mary Lincoln as first lady, from directly after the inauguration to just before her husband's assassination. And as a critique of historical biography, I primarily rely on those of my sources, and I had quite a few to choose from, I have to say. Uh, there is no shortage of information on either of the Lincolns, but I had to pare that down a little bit. So I've looked at just a couple of what I've considered to be the most prominent and the ones that uh, look a lot at Mary Lincoln's um, role and her time as First Lady. So I look at um, William H. Herndon's Life of Lincoln, David Herbert Donald's biography of Abraham Lincoln, My Michael Burlingame's massive of, um, volumes on Abraham Lincoln, and then for Mary Lincoln, Jean H. Baker's biography and Catherine Clinton's biography as well. So my main purpose here is not to provide a new perspective on Lincoln's time as First Lady. This has been, been done, although it could probably use to be done again, perhaps. But instead, I want to explain how a deeper understanding of these 19th century gender expectations can illuminate some of this disagreement among historians. These differing interpretations of Mary Lincoln often stem from an attempt to categorize her, either as the president's wife, as first lady, or as an individual, rather than approaching all three of these roles um, and kind of melding them together in one account. 
Late 19th century biographer William H. Herndon has very little to say about Mary Lincoln's time in the White House. In keeping with those ideas of domesticity, Herndon portrays Lincoln as little more than a famous and troublesome wife. And then David Herbert Donald also cast Lincoln as a spouse as well, and one who was emotionally unavailable and unsupportive of her husband. And this interpretation, again, largely emphasizes Lincoln as a president's wife rather than as first lady or as an individual. Michael Berlingame looks at Lincoln as a first lady and one whose meddling in political affairs perhaps damaged or at least hindered Lincoln as president. In so doing, he places a bit too much emphasis on Lincoln as first lady and not enough on her role as Abraham Lincoln's wife and as an individual. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Mary Lincoln's biographers are a bit more sympathetic to Mary. Uh, Jean H. Baker stresses the ways in which contemporary events during the Civil War and also Lincoln's childhood influenced her behavior and how it was perceived. Um, in particular, she focuses on those limitations imposed on Mary by the cult of domesticity. Catherine Clinton, in contrast, emphasizes Lincoln's role as a public servant during a time of war, and this is where I think more emphasis needs to be placed since that cult of domesticity underwent a change during the Civil War. By highlighting Lincoln's visits to soldiers' hospitals during the war, Clinton indicates the ways in which Lincoln masterfully navigated the restrictive roles for 19th century women and also engaged in wartime service. In so doing, she provides a more nuanced approach to Lincoln. One that, while not overlooking her faults, um, also presents her for who she was as an individual. Quick-tempered, rude, proud, materialistic, selfish, and yet also sensitive and empathetic, a mother who deeply loved her children and a wife who deeply loved her husband. And most importantly, during the Civil War, perhaps a woman who loved her country and, as many Union women did, engaged in wartime activities consistent with domesticity. Ultimately, what I hope to demonstrate is that historical biography must take a critical and yet comprehensive view, not only of its subjects, but of their world as well. Expectations of 19th century women did in some ways shape Lincoln's life, but they did not define her. Instead, Lincoln, an intelligent, well-educated, and strong-willed woman, chose which aspects of domesticity to conform to and which to flout. In addition, historical biography must balance the lives of historical actors as individuals, as those in relationship to others, and as inhabiting various roles throughout their lifetime. The most accurate portrayal of Mary Lincoln is one that fully encompasses her as a wife, as a mother, as a first lady, and as an individual. Women's rights advocate Elizabeth Cady Stanton put it best when she said that a woman should never be viewed, quote, merely in the incidental relations of life as a wife, mother, daughter, or sister. Instead, historians must view Mary Lincoln as an individual, and again, quoting Stanton, as, quote, the arbiter of her own destiny, end quote. So I start with Herndon because he's one of the most famous biographers of Lincoln, and I think one of the first, although I might be wrong about that. So I start with him because it's notable for how he lionizes Lincoln and then also unflatteringly portrays Mary throughout the, throughout the book. Um, perhaps what is most striking about Lincoln's biographical treatment of Mary Lincoln is that aside from a small mention, he himself does not write about her time as first lady. Um, this is partly due to the fact that Herndon relied on others to supply him with information on Lincoln's life that he didn't directly witness. So it's really common for him to use the writings of others when he's talking about Lincoln as president since he wasn't there in DC. Um, so Mary Lincoln appears as first lady in a letter that Lincoln wrote to Herndon after the death of her husband, which I find interesting. Lincoln's own account of her White House tenure is interesting for she frames herself as a supportive, albeit opinionated spouse. Indeed, Lincoln rejects domesticity in which women as supposedly pure and moral beings must remain in the home so that they are not tainted by the sinful world of work and politics. In Lincoln's account, it is Abraham who is kind, um, unsuspecting, and long-suffering, while she is the one who is cunning and worldly wise. Here, Lincoln implies a familiarity with the world of work and politics that is completely out of step with 19th century gender roles. 
Herndon presents it without comment, literally, perhaps because a picture, um, this picture of Mary confirms his own narrative of her as a person who, quote, loved power and prominence. But Lincoln's own motives are unclear. Did her mourning and Protestant faith lead her to believe that Abraham truly was too good for this world? Was she playing into well-circulated and widely held ideas of Abraham as the upstanding lawyer and politician, and she as the unruly and social climbing spouse? Whatever her motives, laced through Lincoln's account, is a motherly concern for Abraham that is confirmed in numerous sources, and one that became more heightened during their time in the White House. Thus, Lincoln gives us a small glimpse that behind the exterior of nonconformity was a wife devoted to her husband's best interest, a devotion that was certainly in line with these ideas of domesticity. David Herbert Donald's 1995 biography of Lincoln takes a critical view of Mary Lincoln as well, principally as a selfish person who was not supportive of her husband's time in office. Um, Donald faults Lincoln for being an unsupportive spouse, particularly during Abraham's struggles as a wartime president. In early 1863, he asserts that Abraham, quote, no longer received much emotional support from Lincoln, end quote, who, concerned with grief over their son Willie's death, quote, seemed unaware that her husband needed relief from the ordeal he was undergoing. Here, Donald implies that Lincoln's problems as president took precedent over any difficulties Lincoln may, uh, might have faced, and also that grieving the death of a son uh, should not have taken away from her duties as a spouse. This expectation that Lincoln lay aside her grief to be a supportive wife overlooks complexities in 19th century domestic ideology, particularly in the area of mourning. Certainly wives were expected in the 19th century to be their husband's companions, but Lincoln's duties, like those of many 19th century women, were divided between those of wife and mother. And as a mother, she had an obligation to mourn her son. 19th century ideas of the good death necessitated this, demonstrated by the fact that the standard period of mourning for a child was one year. By presenting Lincoln's grief as unreasonable, Donald argues that Lincoln was self-absorbed and not a very good presidential spouse. In fact, Donald describes Lincoln emerging from her grief as a process in which she, quote, gained greater control over her emotions, end quote. Once she compared, quote, her own problems with those of her younger half-sister, Emily Todd Helm, end quote, a woman who had lost her husband during the war. The grieving is described as a purely emotional process that one can emerge from merely by taking control of said emotions contradicts the way many in the 19th century would have understood both grieving and death. 19th century Protestant theology encouraged the grieving to view the death of loved ones as part of God's mysterious providence and as a relief from suffering um, for the beloved. But rather than relying solely on an intellectual or theological framework, the bereaved also looked to social and cultural practices to help them through the process of mourning. In particular, 19th century Americans found solace in a culture of mourning that embraced rituals of grieving. And this culture does not seem to have embraced a hierarchy of mourning in which losing a child was less important than losing a spouse. It did mandate different periods of mourning for different relationships, and it also mandated very different mourning rituals for men and women. Ultimately, Donald's portrayal of Lincoln fails to critically examine 19th century gender roles and expectations to illuminate Lincoln's actions. And his insistence that Lincoln's first duty was to be a supportive wife fails to take into account her other identities. Um, as such, she is judged by her ability to successfully meet social expectations without a critical examination of those expectations. In contrast to Donald, Berlin Game considers Mary Lincoln not just as a wife, but as a president spouse who may have damaged his career. Mary Lincoln was, as Berlin Game puts it, quote, a constant source of anxiety and embarrassment to her husband, end quote. Contemporaries described Lincoln as, quote, becoming very unmanageable, end quote, when she learned of changes to Abraham's itinerary during their journey to the White House. In regard to White House servants, Berlin Game attributes the large turnover in staff to, quote, the mercurial Mary Lincoln. And in other passages, Burlingame describes Mary Lincoln as, quote, indiscreet in conversation and rude, end quote. Rather than characterizing Mary Lincoln as unsupportive of her husband, then, here Lincoln is criticized for being too outspoken and too active in politics in all of the wrong ways. In fact, Burlingame starts off his section about the First Lady quoting a Quaker woman who advised Lincoln on how to conduct herself as First Lady. 
Um, this woman said that Lincoln had it, quote, in her power to strengthen his hands, to encourage him, to soothe and cheer him, to shield him from all little cares and annoyances in his home, end quote. So here we see Lincoln as a spouse who proves damaging to her husband's presidency. Instead of encouraging him in greatness, she perhaps prevented him in achieving as much greatness as he was capable. And Burlingame also attributes Lincoln beha Lincoln's behavior as rooted in an outsized sense of her own importance. Um, Burlingame even says that Mary Lincoln regarded herself as, uh, quote, a kind of assistant president um, as she kind of attempted to influence his cabinet point, uh, appointments. Certainly, Lincoln was not shy about sharing her political opinions. Um, but what Burlingame suggests is that Mary Lincoln was too outspoken, too rude, and too angry to be a good first lady. Um, and Mary Lincoln might not have been a good first lady, but perhaps the focus should instead be on what kind of first lady Mary Lincoln was. Unsurprisingly, Mary Lincoln's biographers present a much different and much more favorable depiction of the first lady. Um, Jean Baker, uh, her account distinguishes itself by its reliance on a more nuanced understanding of culture and society, particularly in terms of gender roles. Um, and as a late 20th century work, its primary emphasis is on this idea of separate spheres, one in which men inhabited the outer world of work and politics while women were relegated to the home and family. And Baker positions Lincoln as a woman who knew her place was in the home and yet found, uh, felt a profound attraction to the manly world of work and politics. Indeed, this war between public and private is, for Baker, indicative of a struggle within Mary Lincoln's personality itself. And Baker describes Lincoln as, quote, suffering a wrenching opposition between what she had to do as Mary Todd Lincoln and what she believed 19th century ladies should do, unquote. Thus, for Baker, this Lincoln who enjoyed the mainly world of politics and yet sought to exert her um, uh, authority in the home demonstrated a profound ambivalence about herself. Lincoln knew what she was expected to do, take care of the home, and yet her ambitions and her interest in politics um, made her unusual for her time. So Baker notices this, but roots uh, Lincoln's kind of conflict in her unhappy childhood and the fact that her mother died as a young age, at a young age and she had a difficult relationship with her stepmother. Um, and instead of kind of viewing this as a frustrations of an intelligent and ambitious woman who had a rather limited choice of um, social roles. But turning to um, Cl Catherine Clinton's take on Mary Lincoln, Catherine Clinton instead emphasizes Mary Lincoln's public service. Um, she foregrounds Lincoln's presence at troop reviews, naval yards, and as the war ground on at soldiers' hospitals. Um, Lincoln resumed these visits soon after um, her son Willie's death, and by mid-July 1862, just five months after the death of her son, Lincoln, quote, embarked on a program of ministering to soldiers, end quote, and conducted a rigorous campaign of regular visitations, and she would visit the soldiers and hand out fresh fruit and flowers. And Clinton argues that by January 1863, quote, Mary Lincoln's hospital work had become her most zealous campaign, and she sees another flurry of visits in 1864. Um, these visits are corroborated in numerous newspaper accounts, um, but what's striking to me about these visits is how little other biographers had to say about them at all. Herndon does not mention them. Um, David mentions them in passing. Um, Burlingame devotes a very small paragraph. Um, Baker covers a little bit more. But Clinton discusses these visits seven separate times, and I find that to be really interesting. Clearly, she finds them to be both important and also overlooked. Um, and she also notes that the press covered some of these visits favorably, and the press was known for covering Mary Lincoln very critically. Um, this raises the question of how often Lincoln did review troops, visit veterans' um, homes and Navy yards, and sick and wounded soldiers. Um, as Baker mentions, Lincoln only undertook 11 shopping trips during her entire White House tenure, and yet these have been covered extensively by biographers. In light of this, it's clear that Lincoln's um, uh, this inclusion of her wartime service emphasizes the way in which Lincoln interpreted her role as the most prominent woman in the United States while the country was at war. Uh, by prominently foregrounding these visits, uh, Clinton gives us a sense of the way in which Mary Lincoln put her own individual stamp on the position of First Lady. Uh, 
The Civil War demanded and Mary Lincoln insisted that the nation needed more from its first lady during a time of crisis. And Lincoln, by her hospital visits, demonstrated that the first lady was more than the wife of a president. She was a citizen of the nation uh, who, through her service to fallen soldiers, demonstrated her gratitude to the young men who had risked their lives to preserve the Union. So, to conclude, these biographies demonstrate the necessity of grounding historical actors in their time period, in particular in the context of domesticity, with his expectations of women's behavior, and that this provides an important framework for understanding Lincoln's behavior and her decisions. Without this understanding, biographers tend to overlook the ways in which Lincoln's lack of conformity um, generated criticism from her contemporaries. And it also necessitates that biographers take these cultural and societal expectations seriously and critically examine the ways that contemporaries might criticize someone for kind of flouting these, these um, traditional rules. Most importantly, Lincoln's role as the president's spouse and position as first lady can detract from portraying her as a full human being. In the same speech that I quoted at the beginning of the paper, Elizabeth Cady Stanton went on to argue that, quote, the strongest reason for giving woman the most enlarged freedom of thought and action is the solitude and personal responsibility of her own individual life, quote. Domesticity may have proved limiting to Lincoln. And biographies that consider her only as a president's spouse or as first lady certainly limit her. Lincoln was more than a wife, mother, or first lady. She was an individual who inhabited a particular period of time that did place constraints on woman's behavior, but she also chose which of them to conform to and which to flout. And in a nation sundered by war, Lincoln chose, and a choice that requires more investigation and more attention, to embrace domesticity's insistence that women in time of war privilege the needs of the country. Lincoln's wartime service demonstrates the, quote, solitude and personal responsibility of her own individual life. No one forced Lincoln over her four years as First Lady to repeatedly visit wounded soldiers. Instead, Lincoln made a choice as an individual to prioritize the needs of the nation. Was she loved by all? Certainly not. But Lincoln, for all her faults, must be judged as, quote, the arbiter of her own destiny. Anything less would not do her justice. Thank you. Okay. Well, you are in for a real treat today because you have a journalist from North Dakota <laughs> talking to you about the First Lady of the Confederacy. Uh, and I must say this is a rare conference that even bothers to include the First Lady of the Confederacy, right? So that's uh, a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on today is uh, how Verena Davis tends to be left out. So, since I am a journalism historian, uh, my research is a little different from what you've heard so far in that I study how the press covers first ladies and women politicians. And I look very closely at the word choices that they use and why they do that and what kind of influence that has on history and our perceptions of these women. Now, I started out studying Grace Coolidge and I really kind of stumbled upon Verena Davis. And one of the things that really struck me when I was reading different First Ladies books that have the little biographies about each of the women is that these books don't include Verena Davis. They'll include people like Martha Jefferson and Rachel Jackson, who never even made it to the White House, but Verena Davis is left out. As a reporter, things like that make me very curious. <laughs> and I won't let it go, right? Like, why is this? Uh, I'm very interested in looking at not only the losing side of history, but the part of history that we're just never told about. When you think about 
US history textbooks that kids read in high school. That is such a simplified form of history where certain people get a lot of attention and a lot of people are left out and a lot of people are treated very one dimensionally. Okay, so this is what my interest area is, is pulling up the people from history whose stories are so fascinating and yet they're never told. So I first got started on Verena Davis because I also do work uh, related to women journalists. And I couldn't believe that Verena Davis worked as a journalist. And I found this absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to touch on that briefly. That, that's a completely different piece of work that I did from what I'm talking about today. Um, but her work as a journalist is so important, so I'm going to touch on it. If you're interested in reading more about it, the piece is called The Forgotten First Lady. You can Google it, you can find it, okay? So what's fascinating is what Verena Davis, during her widowhood, like many women during that time, was pretty broke. Jefferson was not the greatest businessman. Who wants to be associated with the ex-president of the Confederacy, right? Um, like other Civil War wives, Verena wrote a book, uh, a huge memoir about uh, Jefferson Davis. I mean, you could keep your front porch door open for years with how big this book was, right? Um, she worked and worked and worked and finally published this book, and then her publisher screwed her out of her money, and then what was she going to do? So Verena Davis ended up working as a journalist for Joseph Pulitzer in the New York world. She moved to New York during her widowhood. Now, how did she have the connection to Joseph Pulitzer? Well, Joseph Pulitzer's wife was Kate Davis, a distant relative of Jefferson Davis. And Winnie Davis, the, uh, Davis's daughter, was good friends with Kate. Winnie Davis was also a writer, so they had that connection. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, you're also in this period in American journalism, which some would say we are again, right? Uh, that's very focused on yellow journalism and sensationalism. So, oh man, we've got the first lady of the Confederacy. Let's hire this woman, right? This is crazy, okay? Sensational. Um, during this time, Sunday newspapers were gaining in much prominence, too. They're, growing in circulation starting out. You start to see the rise of women's sections and newspapers realizing that women's as consumers and buyers, hey, we need to put in some advertising. And to do that, well, we should probably put some content in the newspaper so they want to buy it, so then they look at the ads. So uh, newspapers at this time were looking to get more women uh, writers hired to write this kind of content. This is also a time when advice and etiquette columns really took off. Who better to talk about etiquette than a Southern First Lady? So what did Verena write about? Well, of course, as the Confederate First Lady, she did a lot of writing about the Civil War and attempting to show people her perspective, the perspective of the South, and trying to humanize that the South wasn't just these evil people, that they were humans who had emotions. Uh, she, she wrote a really sympathetic piece about Stonewall Jackson. She also wrote a really great piece talking about the contributions of Southern women and how much they sacrificed during the war. And then, because Verena Davis wouldn't completely change, she also wrote pieces still defending slavery in the late 1800s. Here are some examples of her etiquette columns. This book is actually available in Houston, a very rare book that was published in 1900. The lovely people there uh, copied those pages and sent them to me. Uh, so you can see her talking about uh, wise words for June brides. She had both women and men writing into her, seeking out her etiquette advice. Um, fascinating. So that's how I got interested in Verena Davis. It was actually the end of her life. 
That is the time period that I tend to study the most is 1890 to 1920, which includes Grace Coolidge, of course. So for me, this project was really making me go back in time. I studied the end of her life. Now I need to go back in time and study more so the middle of her life uh, and the Civil War. So a little bit about Verena Davis. She was born in 1826, and she spent her childhood growing up in Mississippi. What's fascinating about her, though, is you think, First Lady of the Confederacy, this woman just must bleed the South, right? But she really had a mixed background that would influence her entire life. Her father's family was from the North, and her grandfather, Richard, Richard Howell, was actually governor of New Jersey uh, at one point. And so she had this really strong connection to the North through her father's family. And then her mother's family was from the South and you know, had plantations and was, you know, they were very wealthy. Um, so she grew up with really both perspectives. Now she never knew her grandfather Howell, but she heard a lot of stories about him and found him to be fascinating. A really pivotal moment in Verena's life came when she was about 12 years old. Her father had headed south to Mississippi shortly after the War of 1812 because he heard that you could get rich if you owned a plantation in the south, and that sounded pretty good to him. Uh, unfortunately, her father was not the greatest businessman, uh, and then with the Panic of 1837, that just compounded, and her father ended up having to file for bankruptcy. This was a very traumatic moment in young Verena's life. To have to see your family's belongings auctioned off. Now, luckily, Verena's uh, mother's family was very wealthy, so that family bought the possessions and gave most of them back to the family. Um, but this really struck Verena about how important it was to have a, a husband, a father, a male figure who could take care of his family. Uh, and that, that's something that she never really forgot. And then she married Jefferson, who we know how that went, right? So this was a struggle she had throughout her life. Verena really had three major figures influence her life when she was young. The first was Joseph Davis, who I'll talk about. I should have had him last. Then she had her grandmother, Kemp. So this was her mother's mother. This woman taught her how to entertain. This woman taught her how to have biting wit and a sense of humor that did not always sit well with other people, right? It wasn't very Southern Belle-like to have a sharp tongue during this age. So that was the Southern influence. Again, we have this North-South balance all throughout Verena's life. Another major uh, influencer for her was Judge George Winchester, a judge who had graduated from uh, Yale who was a player in the Whig party. Verena's family uh, were Whigs during this time. Uh, and he was her tutor and gave her a significant amount of education that girls during this time did not tend to get. Verena also had some schooling in Philadelphia briefly during her youth. So again, the ties to the North and the South constantly back and forth in her life. Now let's talk about Joseph Davis. Joseph Davis was one of the first people that Verena's father met when he moved south. In fact, Joseph Davis was present at the wedding of Verena's parents, so they had long been friends. Joseph Davis was significantly older than Jefferson Davis, and Joseph Davis invited Verena to come visit his plantation when she was 17, which is where she met Jefferson. Meeting Jefferson. By this point, uh, Jefferson had lived a life. Uh, he had been already married to Sarah Knox Taylor, the daughter of future president Zachary Taylor. Uh, he absolutely loved Knox, as she was called uh, during that time. It was very much the romantic young love. However, within a few months of their marriage, both of them became extremely ill. I think malaria, if I remember correctly, but they became very, very ill. Uh, and Knox ended up dying. Um, Jefferson was a widower for eight years then before um, he and Verena ended up getting together. So we have the widower, widower and the teenager. So Verena was 17 and Jefferson was 35. 
when they first met. Shortly after their marriage, Jefferson entered his career in politics, to which uh, Verena noted, then I began to know the bitterness of being a politician's wife. Uh, Jefferson served in the U.S. House of Representatives first, then he served in the Mexican War, then he was a senator, so he was kind of bouncing all over the place. She would spend long periods of time alone. This is a young teenager who is very close to her family. She's away from them. She's alone. She's married to this guy who's much older, who doesn't understand her teenage emotions. Um, so the early part of their marriage uh, was very difficult for her, and again, she had, you know, um, learned this spunk from her grandmother that did not sit well with Jefferson. He did not want spunk. <laughs> he wanted her to do what he told her to do. Um, so Jefferson made it abundantly clear that he disapproved of her willfulness, her stubbornness, and what he considered her unfeminine insistence on independent judgment. This is very difficult for Verena. In fact, one time when uh, Jefferson went back to Washington, D.C., he left her at home until she would shape up, essentially. Um, and then she sent him a very letter that just kills me, uh, you know, calling herself, you know, your thoughtless, dependent wife. And, and she caved. What else choice did she have during this time? Life in Washington. Once the Davises patched up their marriage a little bit, uh, Verena finally got to go to, back to Washington, where she served as a senator's wife, and then Jefferson was also war secretary. And she became very, very close uh, with Margaret Taylor and Jane Pierce. Now, it's a little interesting to think about Margaret Taylor, right? This was the mother of Jefferson's first wife. Sounds like a reality TV show, right, going on here. Um, but they ended up being very close, actually, even though the Taylors initially did not like Jefferson when he was married to Knox. Um, so she really got an inside look at what it was like to be the first lady and helped out quite a bit with Jane Pierce, uh, who, of course, was very devastated um, during her time as first lady from the death of her son. Uh, she was also a very frequent visitor in the Senate. She loved entertaining. Um, so she loved her life in Washington. She absolutely loved it. She had stability. She had friends. Her family started here. Um, and then we hit 1861, um, when Mississippi decides to withdraw from the Union. And shortly thereafter, Jefferson resigns his seat as a senator, and they move back to Mississippi. And Verena talks about how they mourned in secret over the severance of tender ties, both of relationship and friendship. She was very, very sorry to have to leave Washington, D.C., and that this was happening. So as I mentioned, I study journalism. And before we get into the press portrayals, we need to talk a little bit about the journalism of the, of the time. So there were a lot of technological advances by the time the Civil War came around, in that newspapers were being able to be printed at a much more rapid pace due to advances in printing presses. You have the invention of the telegraph in 1844 that allows information to move more quickly. Um, but this is also a wartime. This is a struggle to find reporters because a lot of people are in the war, right? Especially in the South. A lot of the printers uh, in the South joined the cause, left their businesses behind. Um, you also have people, we don't really have journalism schools yet in, the, in you know, the Civil War era, and so you also have people who are very poorly trained. War reporting it remains difficult today for journalists to do, so imagine how difficult it was during the Civil War. Um, and then you also have the fact journalists could be killed during the war. They caught the same diseases. You have generals who don't want them there, so it, this was a very difficult thing to have to cover. So what I ended up doing is I studied uh, press portrayals of Verena Davis between 1861 and 1865 using Chronicling America, which is a Library of Congress database, the historical New York Times, and a couple of other newspaper databases. And I ended up looking at over 200 articles. So one of the first portrayals of her, which should not be surprising, is that she was a Confederate schemer. Uh, she was very much set up, you know, with this caricature, the stereotype, right, um, that she was the bad guy. So there were a number of articles about how she planned to take over the White House, um, that these were the sentiments of a traitor's wife, and these were most common at the very beginning of the war and in 1864 when you really saw this vilification happen. 
Um, this was on a time when reporters really did interviews like you see them doing today. There was a lack of verification techniques. A lot of it was third party information being passed around. Um, but it was really interesting how this material could be seen really as propaganda, as a motivation for both sides. So she was really used as a tool of, hey, the Confederate First Lady says she's going to take over the White House, right? As a means to spur people up. We're not letting that happen. Fight for the Union. Or from the Confederate perspective, yeah, we're going in, right? So it's kind of interesting to think about how propaganda plays a role in, in war reporting. Uh, what's interesting, one of the first articles about Verena was when she stopped in New Orleans uh, on her way to Montgomery to initially meet up with Jefferson after they were selected as president and first lady. Um, and you had the, the military having, you know, playing and honoring her, which you'd think first lady, she'd think that'd be pretty cool, right? Look at these people, they think I'm awesome. But really, she wrote later that the celebration depressed me dreadfully because she really knew that this war was going to be a very terrible thing. Um, and sure enough, the people who celebrated her, she kept tabs on them. And, and when they died, it, it affected her greatly during, during the war. Interestingly, she was both a Confederate schemer and a Northern sympathizer in the press. Um, they caught on that she was maybe not as committed to the South as a Confederate First Lady should have been. Uh, so they wrote about how she was really anti-slavery in sentiment, that there were letters being exchanged between the North and the South with her, which was true. She was still trying to keep connections with her Northern friends. Uh, some of her escaped slaves went up to the North and talked to the press. Um, and they said that she talked about how the Confederacy was about played out, and she sighed and pined for her days in Washington, so this didn't really help her, um, you know, public persona of being the Southern First Lady um, and a figurehead for the Southern cause. Now, some of the Southern newspapers, of course, were, again, trying to build her up with propaganda, talking about how she was really qualified for this job, she embodies Southern feminine character, she's extremely pleasant, so they're trying to use her as this figurehead to rally the South around this cause. We can do this. We have great people in place. Believe in the Southern cause. The North was a little bit mixed. They did give her some positive news coverage. They also dissed her as being not pretty and dressing badly, which, you know, do what you will with that. Um, and then she was mocked when she was, um, you know, packing up to potentially abandon Richmond and how you're leaving your cause behind. What was interesting to me is there were three really big stories that we as journalists today would really latch on to that the press back then really didn't. Uh, one story was that Jefferson fathered a son with a slave. There was only a little coverage about that. And then the death of their five-year-old son, Joseph, is something that I was surprised didn't get more press coverage. Their son, Joseph, Rena had gone to take Jefferson lunch at work because he was so stressed and wasn't eating. While she was gone, their son was on a balcony of the Confederate White House and fell off and ended up dying. So Verena Davis really has a lot of similarities to Mary Todd Lincoln that are fascinating to explore of some of the same things they endured during the war. And then another big story, she, uh, there was a story about how Francis Preston Blair Lincoln sent him down to try to get the war to end. And apparently Verena went into ecstasies the moment that she saw him so relieved that maybe the war was finally over. Which again, if you are a symbol of the Confederate cause, this is not what other people in the South want to read about you. Okay, so to wrap up, I was really surprised that there wasn't more coverage than there was. Now, this could also be a database issue, right? Historical societies are continuing to add more newspaper content and make it electronic as time goes on. So it'll be interesting to see how much more is added. Uh, I only found one comparison to Mary Lincoln in here, um, and it was basically saying that uh, Davis was better than Mary Lincoln because she dressed plainly, attended church, avoided places of amusement, and walked when she went out, and that she was much more seemly and to our liking than Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, we saw the early attempts to vilify her, her use as a propaganda tool. But was, what was interesting to me is that she was treated legitimately. So now we leave her out of books. We forget that Verena Davis really even existed. 
But her contemporaries considered her to be legitimate. She was the Confederate First Lady. She was in a position of power. Um, it's interesting to think about the symbolic role of First Ladies, especially with that initial Southern press coverage and their pride in her. But the last thing that's really interesting to me, and it's the, you know, she's just not that into you thing. Um, it's interesting to think about how, what difference there is when a first lady buys into her husband, the presidency, and his administration. When the first lady and the president are partners together in a cause, and what difference that can make for an administration. Now, I'm not saying that the Civil War would have gone differently if Verena had you know, been, woo, Southern pride, right? Uh, I'm not saying that. But the fact that she didn't fully buy into her husband's cause and the fact that it was so disastrous is really interesting to think about. When you think of the top first lady, when you think of Eleanor Roosevelt, right? When you think of Ellen Wilson and these strong first ladies who really supported their husband's administrations and how much more successfully we also tend to think of these men, it's just really interesting to think about the power of a first lady and how important she is to our nation's history. Thank you. All right, we got some time for uh, some Q&A. So uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or uh, file to the back and uh, use the microphone back there. Thank you. But you go first. Yeah, well, um, they were suspicious. Can you hear? Could you reframe the question, Sylvia? The question is, why was there so much antagonism towards Mary Lincoln um, based on the ground that she was Southern? Is that your question? Some of it was, yeah. Um, but I would... We, we would agree, I think, that there, were, there was a lot going on there. Um, part of it was that she was Southern. Her family visited the White House during the Civil War. So, <laughs> you know, your house guests are the enemy. Um, and that didn't play well with the, with the Northern public, but why don't you? I think all that I was gonna add was that there, there are some suspicions, um, and I think that they tend to come from uh, Republicans. So it's very divided, I think, along like party lines. Um, but there's also um, a lot of Southern influence in Washington, D.C., um, kind of immediately up to the Civil War, and then I think even following, too. And the Lincolns are really seen as an outsider. Um, I mean, yes, Lincoln, Mary Lincoln grew up in Kentucky, but she lived for a really long time in Illinois. And so there's this perception of them being from this kind of frontier region of the country. You know, they're from the West. You know, there's, they're not as cultured as people from the Northeast or from the South. So I think there's some complexity to it that's interesting. She's suspected for having these Southern leanings. There's a couple things that she says. Um, but then she also is very public in her support of the Union, which is interesting. But then there's criticism from her... Um, from the other side, and that the sense she's from this, she's from this frontier, and she's not as cultured as yeah, other people. Yeah, I, I would just add that you, when you think of uh, Washington D.C. just before the Civil War, this is a southern town, mm -hmm. and when um, Verena Davis, for example, leaves town, Elizabeth Keckley is her seamstress, and she says, "Elizabeth, you need to go south with me." Now, just think about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you need, I need you, you know, you need to go south with me. And Elizabeth says, no, thank you. <laughs> but, you know, there's sort of the, the, the whole mindset is a very southern mindset. Um, and there is a mass migration once the south starts to secede, which, you know, you read the quote about, you know, she's leaving friends. She really loved Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. Marina Davis. Um, she's leaving friends. She's leaving associations. Um, so, 
but the whole idea that Washington is Southern before the Civil War, and that changes so dramatically, um, I think is really important to consider. Thank you. Um, Terry, my question's for you, because I think this was so fascinating to hear the stories of the lesser known figures, these women in, in our history. And even as much as we know, we read about Mary Lincoln. I mean, from Laura, Sylvia, we're learning still so much more. So there's such a rich body of information that's still out there to be tapped. But my question for you is, are there other figures like Verena Davis that you're going to be you're, you're going to do study on, reporting on, presentations like this? Um, is there any effort that you know of to include their stories in the teaching of history? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, right now. The project that I'm working on is studying the anti-suffrage movement. So we're getting away from first ladies here. But right now I'm, I'm looking at the anti-suffrage movement. Because again, we tend to focus on the suffragists, the winning side of history. Woo, women have the right to vote. That's awesome, right? Um, but I'm really interested in looking at these anti-suffragists and, and how they were portrayed in the press and that more kind of conservative a uh, woman viewpoint and why these women were so adamant that this is something that would, women shouldn't have. So right now I'm working on trying to bring their voices more so to life. Um, that's what I'm working on right now. I, I certainly like to study the, the lesser known first ladies, um, the people like Margaret Taylor. Like, does anybody in this room know my, well, other than the people probably <laughs> with me, right? I mean, but like, what do you know about Jane Pierce? What do you know about Margaret Taylor? Not much, right? Um, God bless Eleanor Jackie Kennedy. I love them, right? Um, but there's so many first ladies with so many fascinating stories that we need to dig into yet and see what kind of influence they have. So if anybody has a suggestion for me of what first lady I should do next, I'm welcome to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I guess we have time for one more question. Oh. And this is a, I'm plugging something. So I just want to say in the quest of looking for women and their stories, the National Women's History Museum, uh, nwhm.org. It exists right now on the web. They're working to get an actual physical museum. But if you go on, they've been up, up for 20 years and they tell the stories of all kinds of women you never heard of. So that's just a plug for that. Anybody else? I guess we do have time for one more question. <laughs> Uh, this question is more for Laura and Sylvia. I was curious, um, so a big part of what we see after Lincoln is assassinated is sort of this um, let's lionizing of Lincoln uh, and sort of comparing him with Washington, and he's still consistently ranked as one of the most popular and best presidents, however you want to characterize it. Do you think these perceptions of Mary Todd Lincoln sort of evolve from that, that she sort of becomes a villain to that story uh, that Lincoln is the savior of the nation and, and in a way like he's able to overcome so many things and that historians then sort of characterize Mary Todd Lincoln as something that he had just had to, an obstacle really. I think that's the way some of his biographers have certainly treated her, particularly Michael Burlingame. He's very much like Lincoln could have been a much better president if he wasn't saddled with this, you know, you know, hellcat of a wife, as his secretaries refer to her. Um, I, I was thinking about that a lot when I was writing my paper. I don't know if Sylvia did or not, but just this the way that someone who is assassinated, just the tragedy of that and how that can affect people's memories. And I think that that was really interesting why I started with Herndon's account is that it does come from, you know, after Lincoln is assassinated, he kind of begins to put together, you know, these writings, his memories and those things. And and historians have debated whether or not, you know, his treatment of Lincoln has influenced. Um, I, I don't think they particularly liked each other that well anyway, um, but whether the way he's portraying Mary Lincoln is because of this, um, yeah, this kind of lionizing of Lincoln that takes place after he's assassinated. I guess what I would add is um, what's missing from the story that is is the degree to which Lincoln was important to the African American community 
uh, which I mean, he, if he was lionized by whites, he was certainly lionized by blacks, and just bringing the whole thing back. When Elizabeth Keckley talks about going to New York to help Mary Lincoln, she never says, I, I, I'm going to New York because I love this woman. I go to this, I'm not going to New York because she's my friend. She says, I went to, to New York because I, in honor of the man who freed my people. So I think if you put those two stories together, you get a really good picture of you know what Lincoln meant. And Lincoln, Mary Lincoln could never have competed with what Lincoln came to mean to the American people. All right, uh, before we thank our panelists one more time and break for lunch, I was have what is one more quick plug, very quick. So this is another thought for uh, research areas in answer to your question. And I would encourage people to look toward the political wife more generally. Don't limit it just to first ladies, but look at the spouses of vice presidents, the spouses of members of Congress, the spouses of governors, et cetera. And there's quite a bit to be gained from that sort of study. And okay. So much for lunch. But I wanted to make a comment to really all of you, but the, the Lincoln one. Women in the time. Oh, women. Did that do? Women at the time Mrs. Lincoln went to the White House were much in the news. Empress Eugenie in France, uh, Victoria, in her late 30s by then, I believe, and not to mention Harriet Lane, who had been the, probably the most glittering first lady ever in the White House. She came from the British court with her uncle, and she became her bachelor uncle's uh, uh, hostess, and she did it well. She did it well. She was spoiled rotten. And she loved to entertain and loved to dress. And people, Miss Lane simply met Harriet Lane in the newspapers. And I've always wondered if Mrs. Lincoln, and then the mention of her lack of publicity, if Mrs. Lincoln saw her a certain obligation to be one of those, one of those glamour girls that were so uh, much in the news at the time. I think that she did. A lot of Mary Lincoln's biographers, at least what I read, um, contextualized her fashion choices, which there's a lot of disagreement about, you know, the clothes that she wore, and she wore really youthful colors, and um, that she felt like she needed to have this status as a president's um, wife and be positioning herself as um, someone who would be similar to, say, um, the, um, the the emperor of France's, um, the empress of France, or, um, you know, the the you know, Queen of England, perhaps, in her stature. And she's criticized for that. But I think she definitely saw herself kind of in a larger international context. And I would just add that uh, her, her great um, rival was Kate Sprague, who was you know, well-connected in Washington, D.C. And they were vying to be the head of uh, Washington society. And so, I mean, Lincoln was very competitive. You know, she's got this rival. She's going to try to outdo Kate. Um, they, of course, had no use for one another at all. <laughs> um, but this, you know, this idea that First Lady is the head of Washington society, I think, was extraordinarily 